everyone. My name is uh, E. David Crawford, and welcome to our pet tumor board. This is, it really is a multidisciplinary tumor board, and these cases are all fresh cases. Actually, some of them that we present, we're waiting for the results of the tumor board to we'll make a recommendation to the patient. Joining me is this tumor board. We have two medical oncologists, Dr. Dan Petulak from Yale, Dr. Andrew Hahn from MD Anderson. We have two urologists. I'm one of them. The other one is Wayne Brisbane from UCLA, who's had a tremendous experience in his early career in this area. We have a radiologist, nuclear medicine physician, Dr. Uh, Sharif Gami from uh, the University of California in San Diego. And uh, finally, a radiation oncologist, who recently left the Washington, D.C. area to the warmth of, of uh, northern Florida, almost, um, uh, Tampa area. And we welcome Dr. Sean Collins. All right, this is my case, and we'll get going. It is a 57-year-old male who uh, I just saw prevent, uh, presented for a second opinion and for an elevated PSA. He has hypertension, and I'll bring that up a little bit later. So he is, uh, was seen at uh, the end of June, just uh, recently, with a PSA of 14.9. It gradually got to that time, that, that well over a period of time, actually went from about 9 to 14 over a period of 18 months. His prostate size, I can tell you, was 25.8. He has a PSA density, which is rather worrisome. And I think PSA density is a, an important thing to look at in these patients. And he's in reasonably good health, Charleston score. No family history of prostate cancer. Wayne, what's your next step? Yeah, so in our shop, we would offer him an MRI and very likely biopsy. Okay, so I'll just fill you in what happened with him. He did get an MRI, which we'll go over in a minute. His biopsy uh, showed that he had a grade group 2, 5 of 12 cores, a PSA density we already discussed, uh, and NCCN favorable risk intermediate. And so one of, the, one of the things that I've been doing for probably uh, wait um, almost a decade now, or some sort of molecular markers on patients to determine whether to do a biopsy. However, I'm not sure what the value of those would be in somebody with PSA of 15. I mean, almost any, we're, I mean, we're usually talking about people with lower PSAs. But I'm going to show you where I think this might play a role. If somebody's diagnosed with a cancer, Having the marker, are, they're also helpful in determining maybe the aggressiveness of it. Is it a different 3, 4, 7, or a 4, 3, 7? And I also think it's important that, and we're looking at this for following patients on active surveillance. So he had a couple of molecular tests done. Um, this is called My Prostate Score 2, and he also had a select MDX both of which showed a greater than average risk of having a grade group two or above, and it was accurate. So here's our MRI, and again, I don't want to throw this uh, blindly at Sharif to look at, but the volume was uh, 25, and you can... He had no evidence of capsular uh, invasion or anything like that. And he had a, a region of interest that was uh, present and that was uh, uh, also biopsied. Any, anything new with MRIs coming along, Sharif? I know people are, are uh, talking about maybe different approaches. Uh, any comments? Anything new? Uh, at this point, I don't think there's any consensus as far as um, new approaches uh, relating to MRI. I think obviously the, um, the 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 use of the coil I think is extremely helpful, and I think I, I most of the oncologists would agree with that because that 
outlines clearly or at least helps outline a little more clearly the the um, extent of disease but i think the 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 area that i would still push towards is pet mri fusion as a just as a standard of care maybe going forward i know that may be a leap at this point but i can't imagine why we're not doing that because most patients will always get the mri and from what I can see in these tumor boards and from practice, clinical practice, most patients will get a PSMA PET scan. And so it, it just makes absolute logical sense that that would be the next next thing we do. So not, not necessarily not, anything not, different not, from MRI pro protocols, but go ahead, Dr. Crawford. Oh, no, I, I, I think it's great, but one of the, th the drawbacks uh, uh, of the PET scanning is something you need to have a diagnosis and we don't have we we didn't have one when the MRI was done. So I mean that's I agree. I agree. In this yeah. case, yes, I agree. That with a PSA of fourteen, I think it would be so. No, no big deal. He, uh, what what was going on with him? Here's his biopsies: Gleason six, three, four, seven, in the right base. Here's the uh, MRI and. Uh, you want to comment on that? We ordered it was uh, you read it. And I'm sure you read a lot of them. You don't remember. Yes, um, just just the comment was that um, clearly from the MRI images, the lesion seemed a lot larger than what it looks like on the PSMA PET scan, and so a lot of the soft tissue changes that occur surrounding the actual site of the lesion, as this was reported from the six to nine o'clock position. So as I embarked on reading it. I was expecting a much larger lesion um, than what I see here on the PSMA PET scan. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, this probably will uh, factor into the surgical decision making in this case. And then there's a couple of ribs that are involved too. Um, I, I looked at the ribs and, and they were consecutive ribs. Um, and I, I, I want to make a comment about that because we tend to see quite a few rib findings that are just, they don't fit the story. And um, a lot of the, the, the newer sort of follow-up was, was found to be fibrous dysplasia is, is one diagnosis that we tend to see PSMA labeling that really is not metastatic, obviously. And then if, if you do come across situations where the rib lesions or the rib findings are consecutive, more likely than not, it's, it's post-trauma related. And usually just asking the patient helps confirm that. Great teaching point, and that's one of the things we want to get out of all of these because we do see a lot of rib lesions. What you just said is consecutive, contiguous, old fracture, something like that, things like that. And, and I, I've, I've seen people in second opinion that they had their, their treatment uh, radically altered by one rib lesion. And Dan, you're shaking your head. I, compl I completely agree. I had a case not too long ago, maybe two years ago, somebody who 14 years out from prostatectomy, he had a positive PSMA PET scan in his bed, as well as a positive rib. And they were going to call him metastatic. And I said, this doesn't fit the clinical picture. And at a low PSA level. So we radiated the prostate bed. We gave him hormones, stopped his hormone therapy, testosterone's back up. That rib lesion still persists with his PSA being undetectable. Yeah. So if there's if there is a question about a rib rib lesion, Sharif uh, or two, what what's the what what should you do? An MRI, plain films, what? So I, I think the first and very most important thing is looking at the CT side of uh, the images of the PET CT and making sure there is no clear osseous lesion. Obviously, that would be step one. The st step two would be asking the patient about a recent history of trauma to this area. Absent any CT findings, absent any trauma. I think MRI makes sense to if if it's going to drastically change management, especially if if again uh, 14 years after surgery and and the patient has no other uh, evidence of disease other than the prostate bed, it it would just be unusual for a solitary rib metastatic lesion, not unheard of, but unusual. So I would say MRI would be the next best right. after looking at the CT and confirming history. So I mean, we we kind of thought that 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 was a nothing. One of the things that uh, we do when when people have a three, four, seven, and we're we're trying to decide what to do. Uh, of course, this guy had a um, relatively elevated PSA and PSA density. Is uh, 
uh, molecular tests. And there are a number of one. This is a new one out there called Prostatype that um, has been extensively studied in Europe. And they have almost 20-year data now on people on active surveillance versus that. Because one of the things that came to this guy's attention was with what he had with a 6 and a 347, which may have underrepresented what he had was doing active surveillance. But these sort of tests like this, uh, Oncotype uh, and Polaris and things, I think are helpful. Not everybody agrees, but they, there are data points. So I guess the, um, the, the question with this guy is where to go from here. Wayne, just really quickly in 10 seconds, what would you do with him? Yeah, so I would treat him as a localized disease. Uh, I think I'm going to ignore the red lesion for this point. I'd obviously discuss with colleagues, but I'd make sure he had a chance to talk with Sean and myself and author him surgery or radiation. Okay. Sean? I think he's a good candidate for surgery. He's 57 years old. I think Wayne will get it all and cure him. Okay. Very good. And he actually is leaning that way. He knows he's going to be presented here. He was swayed somewhat by the markers and not it, uh, about not proceeding with active surveillance. Uh, there, there are a number of things that are going on with him that I think that having at least the payoff to look at is important. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. A great, uh, great discussion, and we all appreciate it, and so will the patient when he hears about it.